The biggest misconception of being an architect is most people still believe that to be able to draw a good floor plan, you actually have to know how to draw. When the fact of the matter is, most of drawing a good floor plan has actually nothing to do with understanding how to draw. What's going on guys? My name is David Tomich and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, firstly, thank you so much for joining me. Today, I'm talking about the fundamental basics of developing an architectural floor plan. Now, as a fully qualified architect here in Western Australia, I've drawn many floor plans in my day, yet I am a terrible artist, as you'll see throughout this whole video. Starting at the very beginning, you actually have to understand the client's brief. The client's brief is incredibly important. If you don't know what they're looking to build, if you don't know how much they're looking to spend, or even if you don't know what time frame they need to be in this new property by, are all things that could lead you astray if you don't nail that brief straight away. So before you even put pen to paper or pen to iPad, it's genuinely all about understanding the client brief and understanding them as a person. Being able to engage with another individual and understand their likes and dislikes in a short period of time is a slowly acquired skill that you will develop throughout your career. But once you've mastered the briefing process, you'll actually be able to start the process of designing a floor plan. One of the most important elements of any floor plan and any architectural design is being able to understand the site. So for me personally, it's all about going to that site first, understanding the parameters of the site, the limitations of the site, and any issues that might arise if I hadn't been there in person. Just because we have the liberty and luxury of Google Maps and we can easily just type in their address and look at Street View doesn't mean we actually understand that property in any way, shape or form especially if you're working on rural properties where Google Maps is so outdated that it almost isn't worth looking at. When you're on site for the first time, make sure you take as many photos and videos of that site as possible. When you actually start designing and drawing, it's gonna be critical because your memory is gonna be jogged and you're gonna to have to remember every single detail. So say there's a giant rock in the way or a tree somewhere that you need to keep, you really wanna be able to look back at those photos, understand the size, the scale, the grandeur of all these items, because not everything is perfectly depicted in a feature survey. Just because this information may be readily available to you, doesn't mean it's 100% accurate and it's gonna give you the same effect as understanding that knowledge firsthand. So going out on site is where every architect or any designer or anybody just looking to draw a floor plan should be starting. You really need to understand the parameters as much as possible before you start putting together any ideas. Once you've taken a good walk on the site, it's time to actually sit down at your desk and understand the local planning policies and statutory regulations. It doesn't matter how good of an architect you are or how good of a designer you are if you don't know the local planning policies. There are so many times that you can get caught out right at the end of the project if you don't look these up straight away. So it may be a very boring and tedious process that you have to spend one, two, maybe three hours if you're not relevant with that council to understand their planning policies and guidelines but it is genuinely something that can completely change the final product of your design. To give you an example, if it's in a heritage restricted site, potentially you can only use bricks as your staple material, or maybe they have a very heavy landscaping policy that they want two or three giant trees planted on that site. If you go ahead and design this beautiful timber frame clad house with absolutely no landscaping, that entire design could get thrown out the window and be an absolute waste of everybody's time and money. So understanding the fundamental principles of that planning policy and the restrictions to that block could mean the difference between a good design and one that will never get built. Now, most of the time, clients will actually tell you what they want. Most clients nowadays give you a Pinterest mood board or some sort of photographic collage of images mashed together of what they truly like. So it's a good starting point as an architect to understand the client's brief. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't go out and do our own precedent research. Now, obviously, to become a qualified architect, you have to do a lot of history in architecture and you learn about all the greats in architecture. However, having said that, this doesn't have to be your primary source of architectural inspiration. 
Yes, the greats are very inspirational and they are the greats for a very particular reason. However, I'm personally finding that there are many, many talented people out in the world that are just exuberating architectural flair, confidence and just incredible designs and have never been recognized for their work. I follow so many different pages on Instagram, on Twitter, on Pinterest, on YouTube of just different architects and designers putting together what they genuinely like. This is usually where I draw to for my inspiration. I can go onto my Instagram page, scroll for days and days and days until I find a genuine collective series of images that I think will best suit the collective palette of what we're trying to create. Now, I usually try and break it down by project and by room. So I will do a very basic analysis at the start of what the project should look like overall as a whole, and then I'll start breaking it down internally. Now that we've broken down the site, we've understood the brief and understood some of the precedents that might influence this project, it's actually time to start diagramming. Usually what I do is get out my iPad and start sketching some very basic diagrams. Like I said previously, I'm a terrible artist. It is not what I'm good at. It is not what I'm known for. Nonetheless, I still do a lot of diagramming at the start to really get my brain onto paper as quickly as I possibly can. So I'll start by diagramming the site, understanding the solar parameters, understanding how the wind flows through that site, and referring back to my original site visit. I'll look at where potentially the best vistas are, how the neighbor's properties interact. Will that neighboring property be affecting any area that I'm critically attached to in some of my original design concepts? Will most of my living spaces be completely overshadowed and be useless as a result? These are all simple diagrams that can be sketched within a matter of minutes, if not a matter of seconds, depending how rough and quick they are. They don't really need to make sense to anybody but yourself. So it's all about understanding the principles of the site and what can and what cannot be achieved. Once I understand the fundamental basic principle of a layout of what this site might actually encompass and where the garage might be located to the street, how the main living residence interacts with the sleeping quarters, what the landscaping and what the actual environment looks like, then I genuinely move into the 2D and the 3D software being ARCHICAD for me personally. I usually start on ARCHICAD with some generic mapping of the site, understanding the actual contours and then plotting my diagrams onto it. This is where I begin understanding the site in 3D and understanding how this might actually affect the building in its grand scale and size. I'm constantly switching between 2D and 3D at this point, creating the elevations simultaneously with the floor plan. Now this isn't something that most architects do, nor most people do in general. This is something that I've found to be quite unique to myself. I'll quite often start designing the floor plan and then all of a sudden stop, jump to that elevation, start designing that elevation and let that elevation influence and inspire the rest of the design. The best part about working in 2D and 3D is it means you can quickly draw sections, understand spaces, understand volumes and height, understand how the flow of the building really works. You can fly through the model itself and you can also understand light in a very quick and easy manner. Solar studies are something that I do all the time in early days and early stages to understand if an overhang needs to be bigger or shorter, how that environment needs to interact, if a deciduous tree needs to be planted, and all these simple elements that I learned through years of experience. The biggest thing about an architectural floor plan is it's never truly finished. It's only finished when you stop working on it. As an architect, you can continue working on a floor plan forever and continuously manipulate and change it. A hundred different variations of the same floor plan can be adapted and manipulated until the perfect floor plan is actually never created. There is always something new happening in architecture that's gonna change how a floor plan is drawn originally. That could be something as simple as a planning policy changing or construction techniques changing entirely. It could also be so fundamental that our understanding of solar passive principles might change in the near future based on how we live our lives. So even though you might finish off a floor plan and go, this is the best thing ever, just remember that a floor plan is never truly finished and you will always be able to improve a floor plan. Anyway, that's all for me today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure you smash that subscribe button down below and make sure you smash the like button as well. The like button helps with the YouTube algorithm, helps more people see these videos 
helps more people interact and communicate down below in the comments and it helps me understand the type of content you like to see. But like I said, that's enough of me for today, so I'll see you next Monday.